in the grim darkness of the far future, there is only Carl. So, to satisfy my own neurotic need to cover as many games with this logo on it, I have gone truly analog. Let's see how it goes, shall we? Sniper Elite, the board game, was developed by Rebellion Unplugged and specifically designed by David Thompson and Roger Tankersley. Crowdfunding for the game began on Kickstarter in August of 2020, and by the end of the campaign, just 21 days later, it had raised £91,726, far surpassing the £22,000 goal. The campaign had over 1,600 backers, with available reward categories, fittingly named Spotter, Cadet, Marksman, and Elite, ranging from a £1 starting reward, all the way up to the the 80 pound tier, which includes the base game, the expansion called Eagle's Nest, and the deluxe upgrade kit, because no, even their physical games aren't free of day one DLC. Now, right off the bat, you're going to notice this box is heavy, and opening it up, the whole package certainly feels premium. Inside the box, you get a double-sided game board containing both the submarine pens and launch facility maps, two secret dry erase boards, 30 shot tokens and a velvet draw bag, a dry erase marker, 10 tracking cubes, 12 action cubes, 10 ink washed miniatures, 12 sniper equipment cards, 6 specialist defender cards, 18 objective cards, a solo board, and a custom die. I want to start by talking about these minis because I do partake of the plastic crack and my first thought upon seeing them is that I wanted to paint them up. Now, if you're a more talented painter than I, you likely could, but for your average miniature painter, I think they might be a little tough. The fact that their ink wash is nice, it really brings up what details are here, but they're not quite raised enough in my opinion to give you enough for the paint to grab onto. Like, if you look at this orc here I've been working on, there are very raised, definitive edges that can take a good amount of paint, as well as any wash and a varnish of some kind. And yeah, as I'm writing this, I realize that I don't actually know any of the principles behind good miniature design, but I don't know it for board games either, so. But for what it's worth, I did ask some of my favorite painters what they thought, and their sentiments essentially were to get good. So take everything I'm saying with a grain of salt. Now, while you can play this game both multiplayer and solo, it will come as a shock to no one that the multiplayer version is the far superior way to play. By the way, I'm going to go over the setup for both versions, but please don't look at this as any sort of a definitive guide when it comes to gameplay. That already exists, and it's this video right here. I know that because even Rebellion doesn't have a how to play video, they just link to his. But the setup for multiplayer goes like this. You have the Defenders, which can be played by up to three people, and the Sniper, who's played by one. The sniper Sniper's goal is to complete two objectives before being wounded twice. To decide your objectives, depending on which map you're playing on, randomly draw two objective cards, and these will determine what objectives the sniper has to destroy. The sniper also gets to pick three loadout cards that can do various things, from allowing the sniper to shoot twice, to silencing footsteps, to moving defenders out of your way. You also have a shot bag that's loaded with a few different kinds of tokens. I'll explain what they're for and how they're used in a bit. On the defender's side, you have to put them in their designated zones, minding the fact that officers have their own particular spaces. This color grouping is what allows three different people to control the defenders, as each squad has their own actions and movements available during each turn. However, this can end up being kind of a half-assed way to play for the defenders, so it was either myself and another person, or myself, another person, and one other guy who's half paying attention and sometimes gives input to the defender, but not always. You know who you are, Matt. Anyway, the defenders also get to pick some cards. They can pick three specialists cards that each get assigned to a particular squad. These are all insanely useful, and range from a medic, which allows the defenders to shrug off a fatal shot, to the kennel master, who gets two dog tokens that absolutely should have been minis, and these will guard up to two spaces. Each specialist card should be known to both sides, and get two action cubes to correlate their squad color, how many actions are left, as well as a suppression token. The rest of these colored action cubes go onto the countdown tracker, which is used both to keep track of which squads have gone, but also how many rounds are left in the match, as well as the health level of the sniper. And the sniper always goes first. As the sniper, your goal is to destroy two objectives before you're either wounded twice or this countdown board gets to zero. After your first objective is completed, the counter gets reset, but you do always have this ticking clock to contend with. The sniper starts at one of the starting arrows, however it can't be in the same zone as either of your objectives because you just end up being too close. And if you were paying attention in the unboxing portion, you'll no doubt remember the dry erase maps. 
here's what they're for. Because you're never present on the board in mini form unless you've been spotted, all of your movement is done in secret on your dry erase board. These boards provide their own benefits and disadvantages. On the one hand, it's great to be able to actually go back afterwards and see what route the sniper took. However, when doing this, there's a good chance you're going to notice they either broke a rule or weren't playing properly. Most of the time it's not their fault, there are a lot of rules to remember, but you definitely have to trust the people you're playing with, as cheating is quite easy to do. The way I like to think of it is this game has Uno statutes. The only rules are whatever you can convince the table they are. I mean, uh, whatever the table agrees to, of course. Take the loadout cards, for example. Some of them specify you have to declare their use before taking a shot, others you just play silently and reveal at the end. I think clearing things up with your opponents about stuff like this, as far as what exactly is expected, is always a good idea. As the sniper, during your turn you can do three things. You can move, you can shoot, and you can complete an objective or loot. You can do these in any order, or you don't actually have to do anything, which while a risky move, when you think of the timing of the game, it can be a decent option if defenders are zeroing in on you. This is because movement as a sniper looks like this. You can move 0 to 3 spaces, however if you move 0 to 1 spaces, it's silent. 2 to 3 spaces is considered a loud movement. If at any point on your path you pass by an adjacent space to a defender, you have to let your opponent know that that unit heard something. It's also worth mentioning that you can't enter a space a defender is currently on, but they can enter your space, unknowingly or otherwise, on their turn. Some of the maps have different environmental aspects that change how you move around the board. For example, some spaces are enclosed and can only be accessed via a door, while others are elevated and can only be accessed by a ladder. There's also a difficult terrain space that takes double the movement points to walk through. However, in every single game I've played, we never once stepped foot onto these and they're extremely easy to avoid. On to shooting, because what's a sniper elite game without some sniping? That might be a burn depending on how you feel about the most recent entries. But in order to shoot, you have to have a target within your line of sight and count in a straight line the number of spaces between you and the target, including the space they're on. You then get out your shot bag and tell everybody how many tokens you're drawing. The goal is to draw the same number of aim tokens as the number of spaces between you and your target. The catch is that there's more in that bag than just aim tokens. There's actually up to four different kinds. These grayish blue ones are your aim tokens. These are what you're aiming to draw. The red ones are noise tokens, and if you draw two, this is one of the ways your miniature can be revealed on the board. The yellow tokens are recoil tokens, and if you draw five or more combined recoil and noise tokens, your shot misses regardless of how many aim tokens you drew. Finally, there are the blue suppression tokens. You get these for killing officers of each squad for the first time, and these can be used to cancel out a noise token. If you succeed, the chosen target is taken off the board, though they may be redeployed by the defenders later. The outcome of your actions, shooting related or not, can also change what gets added to the shot bag. Killing a soldier adds an aim token, as panicked soldiers are easier targets, taking down an officer earns a suppression token, and a second officer kill grants an aim token, because you're harder to track without leadership. Completing an objective or getting caught during a spot action also adds a noise token. And I will say, it's pretty neat to at least have the reasoning behind certain gameplay mechanics. Game design is one thing, but board game design is a complete other beast. And so far, the trademark characteristics of Sniper Elite are being translated fairly well. As for the other actions during the sniper's turn, you can complete an objective by getting to that numbered space, revealing the card, throwing some expletives at your friends, and then revealing your miniature. If you reach a numbered space that isn't one of your objectives, you can do a loot action, where you pick three of the unused loadout cards randomly and get to pick one to keep. Once this space has been looted, it cannot be looted again for that game. Jumping over to the defender's side, your win conditions as mentioned are to either wound the sniper twice or to just run out the clock. At your disposal, are three squads, each with three units, one officer, and two soldiers. On your turn, each squad can perform actions such as gathering intel, moving, attacking, spotting or sweeping a space, and deploying or dismissing a unit. Each squad gets two action cubes per turn, and something like gathering intel requires both actions. However, this will force the sniper to reveal if they're in the corresponding colored zone. Now, you don't have to tell them exactly where the sniper is hiding, it's just a yes or a no. Other actions, like moving or attacking, costs one action point each, with each action limited to once per unit per turn. Movement consists of two spaces max, and while a defender can unknowingly enter a space with the sniper in it, the sniper would then only require one aim token to take them out. Two defenders also can't occupy the same space at a time. And yeah, I know it kind of feels like I'm reading right out of the rule book here, but this really is just the simplest way to make you understand.
understand how this game works. The spot and sweep actions both reveal the sniper's presence, but differ slightly. Spotting allows a defender to identify if an adjacent space is occupied by the sniper, and if they are, adding a noise token to the bag. Sweeping involves checking two adjacent spaces of the same type for the sniper's presence, and if they're found, the sniper confirms without specifying the exact spot. Deploying allows you to return a dead unit to their zone, however an officer must go back to their designated space, and a soldier requires that an officer is present in the colored zone before they can be redeployed. Dismissing removes a unit from the board, though it's I don't know when you would actually need this, to be honest. I guess it's just nice to have the option. And finally, those specialist abilities we picked out earlier can also be used. They can only be used once a turn, but you can use each one twice. Now, let's say you want to give this game a spin, but the question, do you want to play Sniper Elite the board game, might lose you some friends. There's also a solo mode. For this one, we won't be using the hidden board, specialist cards, or action cubes. In that countdown tracker, we flip it upside down, and it magically turns into the solo board. Also, don't forget your solo cards and your die. This time around, you're going to be putting the units on the numbered objectives instead of the officer and soldier spaces. Taking a look at the cards, these are going to be responsible for the actual flow and direction of gameplay. You've got three sets of solo cards, two for each map, and one that is used on both. All you've got to know is that a mixture of the solo cards will be played like this. There's a defender deck and three cards on the solo board, with one always face down. You also draw two of the loadout cards, placing them face up. They're flipped over when used, and you can't begin with two of the same ones. Ones. Taking a look now at the objective cards, we're going to grab the stack for the map we're playing on, draw two at random, and if they're part of the same suit, i.e. in the same colored zone, you got to put one back and continue to draw until you have two different ones. Next up, I'll take you through what I like to call your HUD and UI, because they most closely mimic actual mechanics we see in the game. Starting with these clear tracker cubes, they're going to be used to mark your current sector when starting, as well as all of the objectives in the zones you're not starting in. These are your possible objectives, and will be important later. This little bit on the solo board is where you're going to mark your LKS, or last known sector. This is the mechanic that is going to allow the defenders to remain in hot pursuit. This is the location they'll always be heading towards, and some cards will force you to reveal your current sector to the defenders. The LKS is sort of like that little ghost of Carl that remains after you were last spotted in the game. And also, while we're talking about these little clear guys, different cards may also instruct you to clear different possible objectives. Objectives. This in turn narrows the defender's scope and allows them to more easily zero in on you. Last on our list of HUD elements is your health stack, and because this is tied so closely to shooting, I'll go over that here too. Our shot bag is set up the same way as in multiplayer, with 6 aim, 3 recoil, and 2 noise tokens to start. But you're actually going to do something kind of cool with the remaining tokens. You're going to stack noise and recoil tokens on top of one another, like so, to make up your health stack kind of cool for them to include this, and you'll notice it sort of looks like the different segments of your health bar in-game. Whenever you take a hit, either from an enemy or because you pulled a card that instructed you to do so, take the top token off your health stack and put it in your bag. Think of this like Carl's heart rate going apeshit after sprinting and getting shot at, so if you try to take a subsequent shot, there's a higher chance that you might miss. You can only take a maximum of three hits in a turn, but if you take a hit while your health stack is empty, you're now wounded. Getting wounded a second time means you you guessed it, you lose the game. That being said, the health stack can be influenced by the outcome of your shots. The shooting procedure stays pretty much the same, you need at least one aim token, blah blah. If your shot is successful, you get to remove one defender from the board, and you can also do one of the following options. You can add one aim token to your shot bag. Your next option is to take one noise token out of your bag and place it on the bottom of your health stack. Your last option is to remove up to two recoil tokens from the bag and add them to the bottom of your health stack. And for every noise token drawn, you have to move the closest defender one space closer. If they end up in your space, you take a hit, but you ignore any further noise tokens. Moving this time around is very similar to the multiplayer game. Moving 0 to 1 spaces will result in no noise, whereas moving 2 to 3 spaces will result in alerting the defenders. And if you move 2 to 3 spaces and aren't in a different colored zone than your last known sector, you take a hit. Looting is also the same, except this time around, after looting, the space is eliminated eliminated as a possible objective. This in turn can make things harder for you, so choose your looting targets wisely. Completing objectives is also almost the same. A noise token gets added to your bag. Where things get interesting is all of the possible objectives in that sector are cleared. 
You then look at all the remaining possible objectives and work from 1 up to 9, and you move the defender farthest from you to guard that objective. You also take any solo cards that have also been completed and shuffle them back into the defender deck. The sniper still goes first, but let's see how things work for the defenders this time. Remember that solo board and that die with the different chevrons on it? This is how it works. At the beginning of the defender's turn, you roll the die, and based on what number you get, that's the solo card that must be resolved. If the card is face down, you flip it over. After resolving this card, the remaining cards on the solo deck are shifted down one, and another card is pulled from the deck. If the card that this one is replacing was originally flipped over, then the new one must be flipped over as well. If the defenders start with an empty deck, you lose the game. At the end of the defender turn, you pick one defender that is off the board, either due to a card rule or because you killed them, and return them to the Iron Cross of the corresponding color. But if you have multiple defenders to pick from, how do you decide? With the snafu rule, of course. With so many more rules to follow and relying on yourself to enforce them, you may run into the issue of not knowing which rules take precedent over others. This is where the snafu rule comes into play. The way it works is simple. Out of any situation where multiple rules may apply, the outcome that sucks the most for you is what you have to go with. I really like this as an overriding direction for some of those crossroad moments where you might be able to take it a bit easier on yourself. Well, that and because this game can require a lot of flipping through the instructions to try to answer specific instances, I could go back and check what the rule specifically is, but instead of frequently flipping through them, I can just put my hands up and say, situation normal, all fucked up. Looking at the defender cards a bit more closely, they're all designed to make life harder for you and don't really change your objective in any way. An example of the biggest pain in the ass is these assignment cards right here. What they do is one, update your LKS so that everyone knows where you are, then you're moving all of the defenders from the sectors other than the one you're currently in to the indicated spaces. This time around, defenders do a lot more hiking around the map than their multiplayer counter parts. If all of this is just too easy for you, the difficulty can be increased with officer challenges. These follow similar rules to the officer assignments from the multiplayer game, but instead each contain two complications to make things harder and one benefit to help you out. The game suggests that if things are too easy, you can disregard the benefit, and if it's too hard, you can disregard the complications. Now, as I mentioned, along with the base game, there were also some extra releases, one being a deluxe edition upgrade. It gives you some clay pieces, an embroidered shop bag, and some extra minis. The more notable addition, however, is the expansion called Eagle's Nest. I'd love to tell you more about this, but I can only assume it was released and sold out of the back of some dude's trunk in the Rebellion parking lot, because I cannot find this thing anywhere. As far as I can tell, it did get a full retail release, but I even went through the process of trying to pay double the retail price to import import it from Australia, but that ended up falling through. They didn't actually have it. I did reach out to Rebellion Unplugged for some assistance, but they never got back to me. Anyway, all of this is a roundabout way of telling you that an expansion exists. I tried multiple avenues to obtain it, and I just couldn't. You have my apologies. All right, we're on our way out through the gift shop, and throughout this whole ride, I've been kind of avoiding having to give some concrete yes or no advice on whether I think this is a game worth buying. At the end of the day, I really don't think it is. I paid a little more than 80 bucks for this game, and while I'm not quite sure what kind of life cycle a lot of board games end up having, it's worth noting this did come out four years ago, so I can only assume any ongoing support is non-existent. Even if, let's say, the expansion was more widely available, I still don't think it's worth it. Even assuming you have three other friends who are willing to split this with you, I can't say you'd play for all that long before it just starts to get a little old. This is a game that's very in-depth for one out of the four players in every game. And while I did play it as a 1v1, it started to get tedious. Like, on the defender's side, if you split the forces between three people, it doesn't feel like there's enough for everybody to do to stay engaged. But if you only have one person playing all of them, it can start to feel like you're looking for a needle in a haystack. The game, in my opinion, it feels heavily weighted in the sniper's favor. I think there's just too many opportunities for the sniper to play conservatively where the defenders just don't have a chance of tracking them down before they're well on their way to completing their second objective. Most of the defender special abilities are really great if you have some idea where the sniper is, but pretty much only the kennel master is going to give you any sort of leg up in tracking them down if you don't already know where they are. 
But to finish my thought on ideal player setup, I do genuinely think playing it the way all my games eventually devolve into is the way to go. 1v1, but have that third player that's kind of half paying attention that will sometimes provide input every now and then. You know, like if you have a movie or something on and they're only tuning in every now and again to provide input. On the more positive side, they did at least translate the video game to a board game in a way that feels very authentic and it's recognizably Sniper Elite. A lot of times when we see the board game versions of other media properties, it's just a rehash of another game with a licensed coat of paint slapped on top. I mean, just look at how many versions of Monopoly there are, and we're not even counting the bootleg copies. I think the designers did a very commendable job in creating something that has both a multiplayer and a single player version. It's just not that fun to play at the end of the day. The fact remains that Sniper Elite the board game is more attractive as a one-off curiosity than anything to invest your money and time in. I don't know if there's a shady underground cabal of board game enthusiasts that homebrew their own rules for existing games, because I'm sure you could come up with some house rules for this game that would make it way more engaging. The designers undeniably gave us a very solid base to build off of, but without any sort of furthering the base game, it's very quickly going to become stale. I guess as one final consolation, at least you have a little Carl you can take with you anywhere you go. This has been an escape from my analog nightmare. Good luck in yours.